Jesus. Welcome. My name is Pamela Smith. I'm chair of the history department this year, and I am very pleased to welcome you to the, the, you to the department's uh, second Dr. S. T. Lee lecture in history. Dr. Seng T. Lee was born in Singapore in 1923, and his generous philanthropy extended not only to numerous gifts to universities and to university libraries in particular, um, all over the world, and also to the kind of rather intriguing um, gift to the Chinese Chess Academy in Beijing, but also to, the, to Columbia University and to the Department of History. And we've benefited um, from his foresight and his generosity in endow endowing this lectureship, which is intended to examine critical issues in international history. Professor Bullitt's lecture tonight, Isthmus Cultures, a Second Opinion on the Origin of Civilization, takes us far back in time and seems probably at first glance to many of you very far removed from present day critical issues in international history. But that's why I'm sure you came to this talk sponsored by the History Department tonight, because we know and you know that analysis of critical issues in the present depend upon understanding the complex causes of how we got here, how these issues came into being in the present. And particularly relevant in Professor Bullock's lecture tonight, in the present day uses and conceptualizations of such fundamental, widely used, and problematic concepts as civilization. Professor Bullitt will provide an original way to think about this extremely fraught term, just as he did in his 2004 book, The Case for Islamo-Christian Civilization. But I'm overstepping my mandate here. I am not supposed to introduce Professor Bullitt. I have instead the very lucky privilege of praising not just one of my extraordinary colleagues, but in fact, two of them. Um, Professor Bullitt will be introduced by Rashid Khalidi, the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies, who is Professor Bullitt's longtime colleague and equally prolific scholar in the history of the Middle East. <coughs> Professor Khalidi receives his BA from Yale, his DPhil from um, Oxford in 1974. And in addition to his very long list of books, um, including recently his 2006 book on the Iron Cage, Palestinian Struggle for Statehood, his 2009 Sewing Crisis, American Dominance, and the Cold War. And I have it, you probably don't all know this now yet, but he has a book just about to be released early next year from Beacon Press, Brokers of Deceit how the U.S. has undermined peace in the Middle East. In addition to these widely discussed and prize-winning books and articles, Professor Khalidi also edits the Journal of Palestine Studies, is past president of Middle East Studies Association, and worked as well as an advisor to the Palestinian delegation to the Madrid and Washington Arab-Israeli peace negotiations from 1991 to 93, when things still looked somewhat hopeful. May I ask you to join me in welcoming um, Professor Rashid Khalidi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, it's, it's a bittersweet uh, occasion to be introducing Richard Bullitt on the occasion of the Wu Lecture. It's, a, it's a sweet in that he much deserves the honor of giving this, this distinguished lecture. And I have a little bit to say about him and how distinguished he himself is. It's bitter in that he is planning to leave the department soon. So uh, this is a this is a, not quite a farewell. He's still teaching, so. <laughs> and it's still around. I have his office, but um, it is it is an occasion for me to reflect on the fact that he and I have been colleagues since I was here in an earlier lifetime, uh, back in the mid '80s, when we were when we were our offices were side by side. Um, and it's not the least surprising to me that Dick's topic, Isthmus Cultures, a Second Opinion on the Origin of Civilization, is not, shall we say, a narrow focus. <laughs> it is in the nature of the man. They even take on something impressive and large and serious. Um, 
this is a this is a, a scholar who has been associated with our university for over 36 years. He's taught at Columbia for a full 36 years. He got his BA uh, from Harvard uh, a full 50 years ago. I learned from the CV today, and his PhD uh, uh, 45 years ago from the same distinguished university. Um, his supervisor there was not, it's not in the CV. His supervisor there was H.A.R.P. the greatest orientalist of his generation, of several generations who was the teacher of the person who taught me. So there was a there. And also the teacher of the people who basically established Middle East studies, modern Middle East history, several other disciplines. Um, or the teacher of people who are now running many important institutions all over the world. Not just in this country, not just in Europe, in Israel, in the Arab world, in Iran, all over the world. Um, whether Gibb or his students, like my own, my own teacher, Albert Khan. Um, these are uh, people who, who uh, really helped to create a field. And Dick is one of the most dis distinguished representatives of that field. I am not going to go through the pages of honors and the pages of books. I will mention that he has seven, what I would argue, truly major monographs. Those are the things that made his scholarly reputation. The thing that I think made Dick Bullock the most, one of the most extraordinary people to teach in our field are the other books. Uh, history uh, of the, the Columbia history of the 20th century that he edited. Uh, a, a book for, I think it's a high school college dance, the global history. Mm -hmm. uh, a book entitled a Crisis in the Middle East, which is a s high school supplementary current events book. Well, you may poo poo those things. He reached more people than most of us in this room through that kind of work. And the dozens and hundreds of TV appearances, the dozens, the hundreds of lectures he gave all over the, all over the country, and not just at Harvard and Princeton and so forth, where of course he was a welcome visitor but at high schools and synagogues and, and, and civic centers and so on and so forth. Um, I noticed that one of your books has the same title as one of mine, Under Siege. Oh. <laughs> you hadn't noticed that. I was trying to think if I'd written the Iron King. No, no. <laughs> mine, was, mine was eight years before you. <laughs> no words um, are perfect. No. <laughs> Um, so I, I think I, I won't say anymore. I could I could I could talk for quite a bit about Dick, who, who's been an old friend and a, and a very dear colleague for many many years. But I think he has a lot to say. So why don't I just let him say it? He's told me he wants a very long time for this. So I will leave you to a master of lecture, and I'll sit down. Dick Ford. Thank you, Rashid. Um, in my 36 years at Columbia, this is the first time I've been invited to give a, uh, a major lecture. Um, and uh, I'm delighted with how many people who have come, uh, my colleagues in the history department, and particularly my uh, doctoral students from previous years. It's just a pleasure to see you all and to see how many people I don't know in this audience. Feel very close to, and who will forgive me for uh, whatever I say? <laughs> um, the idea of talking about the origin of civilization arose uh, two years ago, at about this time, when I taught uh, for the first time and last time a lecture course on the history of the world. Uh, I decided that that lecture course would be um, my one foray into the field. So I had it, uh, uh, videos made of it, and put them on YouTube for anyone to look at. So if you want to get a lot more of the kind of stuff I'll have today, you can always go look at YouTube, just type in my name, and there are all these, all these lectures. However, the reason it arose at that time was, be, was compounded because of uh, the World History Textbook uh, that uh, Rashid mentioned, where one of the issues that arises, not only for, uh, for my textbook, but for that of all other textbook writers, is in an American classroom, let's say an AP course in high school, when you have a substantial number of people of uh, uh, Hispanic background in the class, um, they become kind of discontent 
when they find they aren't mentioned until chapter 12. <laughs> um, whereas the people in the Middle East, the people in Europe, the people in uh, India, um, they have all this early stuff. And then kind of as an afterthought, well, Columbus is coming up, so we'd better do something about them Incas and them Aztecs so that it doesn't appear to be uh, that there was nothing going on in the, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And I became uh, puzzled by how you could make this world history actually a world history uh, prior to Columbus. And as I thought about it, um, I became uh, intrigued by a notion that the English archaeologist Colin Renfrew has written about uh, in a rather flamboyant fashion and uh, gets cited a lot. And it's what he calls the sapient paradox. A sapient paradox is a paradox that arises when people who are sapient, as we are because we are homo sapiens sapiens, do not act uh, sapient. In other words, when people who are genetically, evolutionarily wise do not do wise things. And the wise thing that they don't do is create civilization. And so what Renfrew talks about, what he calls a sapient paradox, is that the uh, consensus of archaeologists and neuroscientists is that by 60,000 years ago, uh, if you know, somewhere between then and 100,000 years ago, we're going to be very loose with dates, right? uh, but let's say 60,000 years ago, Homo sapiens sapiens came into being as a subspecies in East Africa with all of the cognitive capacities that we have now. In other words, we act on the, on the premise nowadays that who we are is who they were and it's all been um, one species since that time. Now we're the products of civilization. Uh, we're very proud of it, despite everything. Um, and what Renfrew said was, why did it take so damn long for these people who had all of the cognitive capacities that we have to come up with the idea of civilization? Um, well, it, it, it's an intriguing uh, question. It is a tricky question because it assumes that civilization is, is an achievement, is a, is a good, as opposed to being a sort of, eh, maybe we would have been better off without it. Um, but uh, what I found particularly intriguing, and as far as I can tell, no one else has made this observation. Is that, when, is that when you compare the new world with the old world, um, maybe I can do this, maybe I can't. Um, oh, yes, there we go, the sapient paradox. And it's on the handout that you have. If you count backwards from the present, you say, what were the earliest civilizations? There is a consensus. The earliest civilizations, that is to say, urban, concentrated, agricultural based uh, uh, societies that had uh, writing and uh, class divisions and so forth and so on. Uh, the earliest civilizations were in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, and in the Indus Valley of southern. Pakistan, roughly the same time. All of them originating, let us say, around 3500 BC, or uh, 5500 years before the present. Um, if you look at that, you find that uh, the earliest civilizations in the um, in the Western Hemisphere are Really not, um, really not comparable at all. Uh, the Olmecs, um, 
the Chavin culture in northern Peru, uh, maybe 1500 BC. So it's a big difference. And so when you read mm -hmm. textbooks, they're never brought into the same framework because the the Western Hemisphere is uh, is so much later than the Eastern Hemisphere. But if you count the other way around, and you say you cannot have a civilization until you have a human population. And then if you say, when did the human population first appear? That is say the human population of Homo sapiens sapiens, not the Neanderthals, not the Homo erectus, or other earlier uh, versions of humankind. But if you say, when did Homo sapiens sapiens first arrive, uh, then you find that the gap in time between the first arrival of Homo sapiens sapiens in uh, <coughs> Egypt, Mesopotamia, uh, southern Indus Valley, and Pakistan is roughly 40,000 years ago. And so the, the gap in time between the earliest appearance of this species that we belong to and the first um, manifestations of civilization um, is about 31,000 years. If you look at the Western Hemisphere, where the current consensus is that Homo sapiens sapiens arrived in the Americas around 15,000 years ago, rather than 40,000 years ago. And you find that from that time to the first urban uh, remains we have of significance uh, arche archaeologically, you have 13,400 years. Um, now what this means is that people in the Western Hemisphere arrived at civilization 20,000 years faster than people in the Eastern Hemisphere. So that even if the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians and the people of the Indus Valley Civilization uh, appear to us to be very alert and very creative, they were also very, very slow. <laughs> they, they just couldn't get the job done for tens of thousands of years. Whereas those people who fetched up in the uh, Western Hemisphere, um, somehow they caught on to the idea of civilization much faster, like 20,000 years faster. Now, the trick here is that you have to assume that your starting point is basically one of equality. And so the, the obvious uh, answer to this seeming discrepancy would be to say, well, those people who arrived in the Americas were already on their way. Uh, and therefore, uh, there wasn't all that much to do to get up to civilization. But, but that really doesn't work because uh, DNA analysis has shown that the forerunners of the first migrants to the New World uh, were not uh, Chinese and Southeast Asians and Indians who were, who may have been pondering, maybe we should get civilized, but well, maybe we'll wait a while. But rather, they were the, uh, their nearest relatives are the Chukchis and the Samoyeds and the other people of Northeast Siberia, who to this day haven't yet decided that they want to have a civilization of their own. Uh, moreover, at the time these first people arrived in the New World, they have no domesticated plants, no domesticated animals, so that if there was some uh, something they were preparing for, uh, it's very hard to see any what it would be. Because in 15,000 15, years ago, whether you were in the New World or the Old World, you were living in Stone Age uh, with uh, little to indicate that civilization would just just be around the corner over a few more thousand years. So, so the question is, why was civilization so accelerated in the New World and so tardy in the Old World? 
Well, um, from the point of view of the first opinion on the origin of civilization, the one that I, uh, that I uh, imply exists because I'm giving a second opinion. Uh, <laughs> uh, from that point of view, the first opinion is that uh, there was a particular area that had wild wheat and barley. Wild wheat and barley, along with sheep and goats and cows, that you put those together with people and you stir and mix for only 20,000 years, and lo and behold, you will get uh, civilization. Uh, and virtually every textbook of, oh, 20 years ago, what sort of took this for granted. You had the Great Fertile Crescent, that this is where the wheat and barley was grown, and people would write, if you grew wheat and barley, you would have a high production of calories per acre, uh, you would have a storable crop, and you would therefore have a denser population, and people would come together, and they would create civilization. Um, that civilization would depend upon their ability to domesticate crops, uh, not just wheat and barley, but eventually other uh, crops, uh, and their ability to domesticate animals. Now, there is virtually no aspect of that uh, sort of wonderful moment of Neolithic civilizational revolution taking place in Egypt and Mesopotamia that is still unchallenged. And the challenges are numerous and diverse. And if you get into the literature, um, you discover that that first view is almost untenable anymore. The challenges are so firm. For example, uh, virtually every textbook will tell you the story of how if you're domesticating wheat, there's just one genetic change, and it's a naturally occurring mutation that causes the seed either to break off or not break off easily from the stalk, uh, the brittle ratchets uh, uh, theory. They say the, the, and they say, this is how domestication occurred. And so wheat and barley, or some people will even say grains in general, uh, they provided the, the magic uh, for domesticating plants. The problem is that other plants uh, that grow in other parts of the world are domesticated as early as wheat and barley in areas that do not then develop civilizations. So that in an archaeological site in New Guinea, it's been established that at the same time wheat and barley appear to have uh, been undergoing domestication in perhaps southern Turkey, you had four crops that were being cultivated in New Guinea that produced at least as many calories per acre as wheat and barley. Um, you had sugar cane. You had taro. Uh, you had um, uh, yams and bananas. But no civilization. No, no big stone buildings or anything. So they say, OK, well, maybe people in the beginning just didn't think hard enough about what they could do with these domestic crops. But then you say, well, in the New World, 10,000 years ago, when wheat and barley were being domesticated, uh, manioc was being domesticated. Now, manioc becomes a staple crop uh, for many of the uh, New World societies. And the basic um, fundamental uh, uh, food stuff. Um, so where was manioc domesticated? Uh, it was domesticated in southwestern Brazil. No one has ever found any big stone buildings in southwestern Brazil or any archaeological civilization. Uh, the, it's a little, little less clear, but it appears that sorghum was probably domesticated in Africa, uh, in the area of the southern Sahara Desert, around the same time, around 10,000 years ago, uh, that uh, Emset and Tef in Ethiopia may have been domesticated uh, that far in the past. 
uh, certainly potatoes, uh, uh, maize were domesticated in that In other words, a lot of crops became uh, controlled by human cultivators uh, around the same time, around 10,000 years ago. Uh, the problem is that the people who domesticated the plants were not the people who subsequently uh, created urban civilizations. Uh, this was, it happened occasionally, but it was not automatic. There is also, in the textbooks, very frequently to say that plants and animals were domesticated at the same time. But this was not true in, uh, in most parts of the world. So that it was true for sheep and goats and cattle in, uh, in the Fertile Crescent. But increasingly, it is our maintained that cattle were probably separately domesticated in at least two other places, the Sahara Desert and in uh, Pakistan. Um, you did not have large domesticates in the New World. Um, and increasingly, uh, the story of domestication has come down to a story of each animal. Each domestication history is a separate history. And none of those histories, uh, in their first iterations at least, uh, correlate with the rise of civilization. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. If you want more on this, I've written a book called Hunters, Herders, and Hamburgers that goes into detail about um, Yeah, I'll get a key. Oh. Uh, okay. So this um, this part of the the first opinion then uh, sort of falls apart. Um, Let me go on to the question of how people came to settle these different parts of the world, because there are very peculiar questions to be asked. When we say that humans, uh, modern humans, homo sapiens sapiens, uh, were in the Middle East 40,000 years ago, we can also say that they were in Europe 40,000 years ago. And we can say, they were in Australia 40,000 years ago. You think, gee, that's a long way from East Africa. How did people get to Australia uh, as early as they got to uh, Egypt? Egypt is just up the block. Um, Europe is hardly much farther. But Australia is just a long, long way away. Um, Yes. <laughs> Civilization. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great thing. Okay. There we go. Uh, computer history department administrator. Mm -hmm. Patrick, do you have the login for this computer? Maybe we can ask a question while that's going on. I thought, they, I thought the um, arrival of human, I mean, I, I thought the arrival in Australia actually predated Egypt. No, I'm it may it. have. Some people say it's 60,000. Years ago, I'm 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 going with the, the conservative dates and all of this. Okay, what uh, what the next slide would be <laughs> would be a um, a map. Oh, <laughs> it's a sort of a Zen map. <laughs> the eastern hemisphere is on your right, the western hemisphere on your left, and that's Australia in between. <laughs> Lecture. 
presentation. You've got a recent items as well. I would point out that you called everyone in this room basically civilizationally retarded. I mean, all of the Europeans, all of the Middle Easterners, anyone who isn't Mesoamerican, you basically said is slow in developing civilization. I think it takes a lot of guts. But that that implies that civilization was good. Yeah, that implies civilization is good. But if we assume that, then we're all civilizationally slow. Well, I think that's true. <laughs> and I think there's lots of evidence to support that. Anyway, um, if you look at a map of the world of around 40,000 years ago. Uh, you are looking at an environment that is in the Ice Age, or one of the Ice Ages, and therefore it has completely different, um, all right, let's go down to, uh, This is a very sketchy effort to show what the uh, world looked like when the uh, sea level was perhaps 400 feet um, below where it is now. And one of the things that is most evident is that Southeast Asia was a subcontinent. It's often referred to as Sunda land uh, by uh, uh, geologists. And Australia and New Guinea were another subcontinent separated by a small um, strait of some sort, and that's often called Sahul Land. But the reason I'm showing this is because if you, if you look at uh, East Africa, you see how that's the Red Sea as that sort of lozenge going up. Um, you can see that the Middle East and Egypt are very, very close. And for that matter, Pakistan is rather close there. It's India sticking down, and Pakistan is to the upper left part of that bend. And Europe is not very far away. Now you look at Australia, and you think, how did people get there? Uh, the answer to that would appear to be um, <coughs> Okay, here's you know, out of Africa. This is where Homo sapiens sapiens go. Some went up this way, some went over here, some went up to Europe, and then some end up over here. Now the question is, why did they get to Australia as fast? It's, you know, if you go, if you're walking, um, this is, you know, following, if you follow the coastlines, uh, it's maybe uh, uh, 10,000 miles, uh, and it took 20,000 years uh, to get there, uh, if 40,000 years is right, which would mean that people would expand uh, about uh, five miles every 10 years. Not such an enormous thing to do on a, on a gradual basis. Uh, but then, when you look at textbooks, what they have, they, they usually show sweeping arrows across <laughs> here and up here, all of which uh, follow the interior, because we have been 
led to think that our earliest forebears were big game hunters. Uh, you know, they hunted mammoths, they hunted <coughs> cave bears, and so forth and so on. Um, but you have to give that some thought. When I was teaching my course on the history of domestic animals, one of the things I would ask early on in the course was if you had no, if you were a, a, a human, an early human, and you had no tools, uh, all you had were your teeth and your nails and your legs, um, and you wanted to start eating meat, what would you eat and how would you get it? The football players would say, oh, I grab a, you know, a reindeer and I, I, I this, this, I break its neck and I kill the reindeer. And, and I'd say, fine, how do you get inside? Because it's covered with leather. And uh, they said, well, I, well, I'd wait for a lion to come along <laughs> and it opened it up for me. And generally the class would concur that, um, that humans probably ate carrion that had been killed by other animals that were uh, predators who did not require uh, special tools. Um, but then the problem is, what do you eat once you're inside? Uh, chewing on muscle, uh, which we call steak, <laughs> is really unpleasant if it hasn't been cooked. And cooking was not automatic uh, early on. And so the general consensus is that you eat the soft bits, the brain, the eyeballs, the, um, the testicles, uh, that usually got to rise out of class, um, and so forth, and uh, you know, organ meats, the things people don't normally eat today when we prefer to eat muscle. But the real answer is not that we went and we ate these big animals that we could uh, track down and, um, and kill, but to a large degree we ate small animals that were easier to get inside and easier to catch, you know, the squirrels and the rabbits and so forth, but mainly we ate the fish. Easiest things to eat are shellfish uh, uh, and other marine life, including fish. Uh, the problem is that archaeologically, these don't leave a lot of remains. Particularly since they are primarily along the coast, and the coast becomes submerged once the ice age passes and the sea level rises. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, people did indeed walk from here to Australia. They followed the coast, the mountains, they didn't go in the interior, in the interior. They followed the coast and they ate uh, the seafood. And then notice that even today in the clam bake, uh, you don't have to have an open fire, really. Um, uh, you don't have to have a vessel. You dig a hole in the sand, you line it with stones. A very primitive way of, of cooking. Uh, even as late as when Europeans arrived in the New World, in New England, in the intertidal area, when the tide went out, the place was crawling with lobsters. But you just went and picked one up. Um, these were not hard to find. And the evidence for the eating of these things are uh, called shell middens, which are basically huge piles of shells that are left from the earliest uh, periods in those areas that did not become subsequently submerged. Uh, so that, let us say, <coughs> At one early site in Southeast Asia, they found 46 pig bones. Um, well, that's pretty good. That shows they had pigs. But they had a shell midden that was um, seven meters deep in solid shells. Uh, the evidence of eating of crustaceans and mollusks and fish um, if you have shells, it's enormous. Bones, not so much. Well, the earliest bones from Southeast Asia, the earliest bone in Southeast Asia uh, is that of the big fish. 
Um, well, it turns out now that uh, there is a new <coughs> technique of discovering how much fish people ate. And this is an analysis of nitrogen isotopes that can be recovered from the uh, bones left by humans and animals. Nitrogen comes in two long-lasting isotopes, nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15. Uh, neither is radioactive. They're just the two different versions of nitrogen. And they are produced um, uh, by plants that take the nitrogen out of the atmosphere. So the ratio of 14 to 15 in the plants will reflect the ratio of 14 to 15 in the atmosphere. Animals cannot take nitrogen from the atmosphere. All the nitrogen that we have uh, in our bodies, which are absolutely necessary for our life, comes from directly or indirectly from the plants that we eat. Now, if we eat um, nothing but plants, uh, then you can look at our nitrogen ratio of 14 to 15. And that will be reflected. But what will be reflected is exactly the same fashion. Because all animals appear to excrete nitrogen 14 and 15 at different rates. So that uh, you will have a little bit more of 15 than you have of 14. If you eat nothing but plants. If you eat animals that eat the plants. The animals will have a little bit more 15 than 14, and you eating the animals, you'll end up with a little, still a little bit more 15 than 14, uh, because uh, you're getting your nitrogen through the animals, as well as through whatever uh, plants you're eating. Now, in, uh, in marine uh, biology, where you have many, many more layer, layers of big fish eats little fish, where you have bitty bitty fish and then you know, slightly bigger fish and slightly bigger fish. You have so many levels of, uh, uh, taphonomic levels are called, of the food chain, that at the very uh, top of the food chain, uh, the disproportion of uh, 14 to 15 is very, is very striking. This is the same process that uh, causes certain chemicals to concentrate in tuna fish and other, uh, and other uh, you know, organisms that are toward the top of the food chain. So that if people eat the fish primarily, they will have a 14 to 15 ratio that reflects uh, the fish that they've eaten, uh, rather than the ratio they would have if they've been eating sheep and goats, which are simply one step away from the vegetation itself. So the result is that while we have looked archaeologically for, uh, for the last several generations at bone assemblages um, and said the bones will tell what the pattern of sustenance was for these people, uh, it's now become impossible to look at the difference between, let us say, animal bones and human bones. So that for um, people living up in this area, uh, Ukraine and Romania, in uh, four to 5,000 uh, BC, which was a what we call the old European civilization, because it was not a fully urban civilization, but it was a very developed uh, Neolithic uh, culture. Um, it's now been argued that if you compare the, the nitrogen ratio for the animals, the sheep and the goats, and the nitrogen ratio for the humans, you can determine that 60% of the animal protein that these people in Ukraine and Romania consumed uh, was from fish. Um, and the likelihood is that humans everywhere uh, were very big eaters of fish and uh, and mollusks and, and crustaceans. Um, enormous number of, uh, of shell middens appear here in Southeast Asia. 
And um, what it suggests is that people followed the coast rather than moving inland following migratory animals. Not all of them, some of them did move inland. I'm not, I'm not denying the validity of that archaeology. I'm just saying that there's a submerged coastal archaeology that uh, reflects a different model, which is uh, following the fish. So you go from here, and you go along, you get through Southeast Asia. Uh, then, what do you do? You go up the Pacific coast. Uh, here's Japan. And you go up, you go across here, you come down here, down here, and down here to Peru. Peru has the most abundant fisheries in the world. And the highest levels of fish consumption that have been found archaeologically among human bones are in Peru from a mummy of, of 5,000 years ago. So, so you think, well, maybe our concentration on big game hunters kind of misses the point. Um, if, for example, you figure that people went 10,000 miles in 20,000 years, and then you figure it's another 20,000 miles to get to Peru, well, it's going to take you to about 15,000 years ago in order to get there. In other words, this is a very plausible um, uh, explanation, and, and it's, it's pretty much fish all the way. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Japan, you know, big fish. Um, Southeast Asia, big fish. Uh, you know, Washington, big salmon. Uh, you get down to, you know, San Diego and the tuna industry. And you finally get down to Peru and you get to this massive amount of anchovies. Uh, we don't know much about uh, climate impact on fisheries. But one thing that is fairly clear. Uh, we think, we think, that's say what I've read here and there, um, is that there's a strong correlation between uh, abundant fish and cold water. So that the cold currents that well up along the Peruvian coast uh, produce um, enormous amounts of fish. And so from Japan up across the Bering Strait and down the, uh, the glacial coast, of uh, Alaska and Canada and down to the Americas, uh, these are cold currents for the most part, particularly if you've ever tried to go swimming in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, these were very, you know, really great fishing areas. It's just that so much of that land, where they might have left archaeological traces, then comes uh, sunk uh, beneath the sea. All right, um, so humans dispersed. They went. Uh, all over the world. Uh, and then at a certain point, they, uh, they build cities. Um, in the, Let's say in the old world, this is the earliest, uh, you know, major, ur uh, not an urban center, but a stone built site. This is in uh, southern Turkey. It is a place called uh, Gubekli Tepe, outside of Urfa. Um, if Jericho had a stone wall of roughly the same age, what you have in Gubekli Tepe is 30 circular uh, structures with enormous stone uprights, uh, each one weighing somewhere in the order of six or seven tons, uh, in a, on a hilltop, uh, in an environment in which there were no domestic plants, no domestic animals, uh, no ceramics, and no tools other than stone. And yet, this complex, whether it's a ritual com complex, we don't know, only four of the circles have been excavated so far. But this complex required a phenomenal amount of labor organized to a common purpose, something that we have normally attributed to civilization and to the ability of uh, of certain people to command the surplus of agricultural 
production for some sort of collective purpose. But here there was no uh, crop surplus <coughs> to be collected in the way that we associate it with Egypt or Mesopotamia. Uh, this is a hunting and gathering society. Um, this is the earliest statue of a person, so far as we know, in the world. Uh, it is from Gobekli Tepe. There is another uh, image very similar to it that is inscribed as a uh, bas relief on one of the uprights uh, in the site of Gobekli Tepe. Uh, and it's quite apparent that these people were hunters. Uh, the one that is uh, still in the site has the man wearing an animal skin around his, uh, around his waist. Uh, this is pretty much life-size, um, maybe five feet tall. Ibrahim, what do you think about five? Um, Ibrahim, my, my, my friend, uh, arranged for me to go there earlier this summer, so it's an absolutely spectacular place that will become one of the great world archaeological uh, centers in the next, in the coming years. Okay, so this is a big stone-built site without domestic uh, plants or animals, and uh, no ceramics. In the New World, uh, the, the comparable site is um, in, in the Peruvian desert. It's called Corral. Uh, six pyramids, a uh, whole bunch of, uh, of elaborate structures. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are uh, a lot of village sites around there, and this uh, this goes back, as you can see from your uh, from your chart here, uh, to um, uh, to around 2600 BC. So it's much later than Gobekli Tepe, uh, and yet it's strikingly similar. You know, stone-built, circular structures and so forth. Um, if you had art showing up in Gubekli uh, Tepe, you have music showing up at Corral. Uh, this is a collection of 36 whistles or flutes that have been activated there, made out of pelican bones. Uh, now these are human populations, totally different parts of the world, uh, separated by thousands of years and totally different traditions, and yet when it comes to art, music, and so forth. This is where this notion that, that the species is all one and does the same thing everywhere arises, that you have too much parallelism not, uh, not to have uh, but one species. So my conclusion is that if it took 40,000 years to get to Gobekli Tepe, and it took only uh, 13,000 years get to Corral, uh, and if the existing notion that domesticated plants automatically produce civilization, if that is not valid, then what happened? It's now commonly thought that hunters and gatherers in different parts of the world moved into a stage of um, using plants that they controlled, whether they were uh, grains or roots or tree crops, whatever it was, and lived a stable life uh, without ever moving past the basic hunting-gathering uh, uh, form. Hunters and gatherers, there's a consensus now, I believe, that they lived much healthier lives than uh, civilized farmers did. Um, for example, they had, uh, you know, dental problems were almost non-existent. Uh, cavities came in with the famous wheat and barley. Um, they lived healthier lives. They lived in very egalitarian societies, and they didn't work very hard. Civilization meant that you were unhealthy, you worked your ass off, 
and uh, there was no egalitarian stuff at all. Uh, it was the 99% and the 1%. <laughs> um, so, so the question is, was civilization at the time, as people could not anticipate what the consequences would be, was civilization a step forward, or was it a, you know, a miserable uh, way of life that people fell into for some reason, but most people managed to avoid it. Now, I'm inclined to think that it was uh, something that people fell into because they couldn't avoid it. Now, why couldn't they avoid it? And this gets to this, going, goes back to the issue of people dispersing around the globe. No other species of animal has dispersed everywhere on the globe. Why did people go everywhere? Uh, they didn't know what they were going to find. Um, one thing we know is that uh, they would continually be moving out of the uh, flora pattern that they're familiar with. You now you could say, okay, here's a group, say the, uh, you know, some hunters and gatherers in the Philippines or South Africa, and they collect seeds or roots or uh, leaves from 150 different plants, and that's what they collect. But if they moved 200 miles north, uh, 75 of those plants aren't growing anymore. Everywhere people went, they were continually faced with new plants. Uh, most plants we can't digest. Uh, a fairly big subset of them will kill us. Um, and those that don't kill us will often taste just terrible. Um, so people did not move into new areas in order to sample the plant life. Though over time, they learned about plant life. And this is one of the characteristics of humans, that they learned the plant life where they went. And they learned very different things. Uh, so that, for example, New World, where, the, where you had, say, 3,000 species of cactus, 40 of them will, will make you high and give you hallucinations. <laughs> and the people found out, found out 40 of them very early on. Um, that means they tried all 30, all 3,000. You know, two guys went out and said, you know, Miguel, I'm going to eat this. If I die, tell people, <laughs> don't eat that. Um, if it's insipid, we'll leave it. But if I really get high, um, I'll tell you what it's all like. <laughs> you know, uh, the desire to get, to have hallucinations is one of the big differences between the New World and the Old World. The New World had alcohol. You know, really the stupidest substance, you know. You know, after the next morning, you don't say, oh, what a great drunk I had last night. You say, how miserable I feel. But, you know, after some hallucinations, you say, I had a mystic experience last night. I'm going to tell you all about it. Or, or everybody with it. But, um, so people had to learn the flora everywhere they went. Well, that's time consuming. It's dangerous. But what makes it possible is that almost all flesh is edible. So the people who dispersed around the world um, supported themselves by eating organisms, uh, fauna, whether it was shellfish or regular fish or uh, mammoths, whatever it was. They eat the meat and then gradually they will add garnish. Um, or as a friend of mine from Texas said, the reports are your father says that uh, the vegetables with the steak are what the steak eats, <laughs> <laughs> not human food. You know, humans eat the meat. Uh, and that's, I, I think, more or less true, that uh, eating meat was the, the, the key to the dis dispersal of humans, making it possible. But the question is, why did people want to disperse? And this gets into a kind of philosophical issue. Um, it is often assumed that people defend their territory. 
that conflict and warfare and killing are innate because people will, uh, will hold on to their homeland and they'll only leave the homeland if, uh, if, if their, threat, their existence is threatened if they stay. I'm inclined to think that that's wrong. There's very little evidence for it. Very little evidence for it, uh, despite Stephen Pinker's new book. Um, I'm inclined to think that people don't like to hang around with other people very much. <laughs> and that, you know, if you can see another campsite, you know, it's getting too crowded. And you'd better move on down the beach and uh, try some new territory. And I think atavistically, even today, uh, people, men in particular, think, I'd like to get on a boat and just go out sailing for the next five years. Or I want to go to a place in, uh, in New Hampshire where uh, it's only me. Or I gotta, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to walk the Appalachian Trail from one end to another and hope I don't see anybody else. But, uh, the, the number of human males who are so poorly socialized, let us say, that they really want to be away, uh, probably rivals the number of male orangutans who live uh, proportionally, um, or rival, uh, who live totally solitary lives in the forest. There's no particular reason to assume that humans are as social, uh, or were as social 60,000 years ago as they have now, they have now become. Now, if that's the case, then the question is, um, if, if there's a yen to disperse, what do you do if there's no place to disperse to? What do you do if you are so confined geographically that there is no place to go? And that is the case uh, in the New World. So the first civilizations were in along the Peruvian coast which is a very narrow strip of desert between an enormously abundant uh, Pacific fishing location and the high Andes. And there's no place to go. You can climb the mountains. Um, uh, you can go north, south. There's, no, there's really no place to expand to. And this is where you get the first civilization. The southeastern Mexico, where the Olmecs were, similarly confined between the Caribbean fishery along the coast and the mountains uh, behind the coast. And this is where you get uh, the, first, um, the first civilizations um, in the New World. Now, I'm going to call those isthmuses. In other words, these are very narrowly confined spaces. <coughs> but when it comes to the Old World, um, there's always some place to go. I mean, you go back to this, to this map, and uh, uh, you know the river valleys there in red uh, are where the civilizations arise. The green is where you have uh, you know crops being domesticated, but it's only certain river valleys that. Um, that developed civilization, so that uh, the river valleys of Romania and Ukraine, which were the center of the old European civilization, uh, after, you know, after 4000 BC, the people dispersed. The Neolithic in China um, uh, dispersed around the same time, around 4000 BC. Um, it was only in these particular river valleys, the Nile, the Tigris, Euphrates, and the Indus, that you get civilization. Now, what is the common characteristic of these? Prior to 5000 BC, um, these were surrounded by grasslands. The Sahara Desert, Arabia, uh, Sindh, uh, Rajasthan, these are grassy areas full of wildlife, full of people. And then you had a climate change that began. Uh, in which there was a very, very marked uh, drying up of the climate uh, between 5000 and 2500 BC that caused the Sahara Desert to open up, 
the Arabian Desert and its extensions into Syria and Iraq to open up, and the deserts of southern Pakistan and northwest India to open up. These had not been deserts before that time. And effectively, what happened was that river valleys that had once been you know, rather undesirable swamps in the, mid, in the midst of these grassy plains, they become the only places where people can go. They become isthmuses. Not isthmuses between seas, but isthmuses between, uh, between deserts. If you ever go to Egypt and you stand in the desert on one side of the Nile and you look across, you can see the desert on the other side of the Nile, and everybody in Egypt lives in between, in that you know, five miles or so <coughs> along the river. There's no other place you can live except uh, marginally in, in, in oases here and there in the Western Desert. Um, so what happened, I, I think, is that those places that were the most narrowly confined were the places where people were compelled uh, to live in proximity uh, to one another. Now, the real test case, in a sense, well, there are two. One is um, two of the most flourishing neo-ethic societies that you had, um, and we're on and on. Uh, Neolithic societies that you had uh, when this drying up began, say 5000 BC. Uh, two of the most flourishing Neolithic societies were in northern China, uh, on the North China Plain, and in Ukraine and, uh, and Romania. Uh, but you did not get deserts developing there. The climate changed, the climate deteriorated, and the people dispersed. It is only in the places where you have uh, full desert development that people are forced to live uh, in, the, uh, in the river valleys. So that I think that it is the, uh, the constriction of human settlement that is the, pre, is the prerequisite for the first civilizations, rather than either plant or animal domestication or uh, some sort of uh, in a uh, superiority of a population. Um, now, the test case, the second test case would be Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, on this map, is simply a subcontinent. Gradually, it becomes a great system of islands. Um, over time, one has to realize that you know, that island that we see, you know, 100, 200 meters away, or that our grandfather said were 200 meters away, is now a half mile away. But moving between islands, uh, when you assume that the islands were all larger and much closer together uh, prior to the, uh, the rise of the sea level, um, you could disperse, you couldn't disperse overland, but you could disperse over water. So there, is, there are very strong arguments to be made that seafaring begins in, uh, in Southeast Asia. The history of sail design, which is a fascinating story, I can go into it on some medication, um, suggests that this is where uh, seafaring really developed and that the seeds of what become the, the whole uh, colonial expansion of Polynesians as far as you know, uh, Hawaii and Easter Island is, is, is seeds are being sown back at that time as the um, as the uh, uh, the sea level uh, rises and these islands uh, come into being. So I think you have a, um, a you have different notions of what dispersal is. In some cases, you might disperse inland. In some cases, you might disperse far, farther along the coastline. In some cases you might uh, disperse by water, but the idea that humans desired to disperse, I think, is hard to uh, it's hard to avoid. Whereas we have um, really not that much evidence of, of uh, titanic struggles over over turf in uh, in these very early periods. But now let me point to one final thing because it's particularly puzzling. If you go back to this chart, you find that from the first Paleolithic settlers in what become the River Valley isthmuses 
uh, 40,000 years ago. And the first um, stone built site, Gubek Litepe, Jericho, Chateau Youth, that's 30,000 years plus. Then you have another 5,500 years before you get um, Egypt and Mesopotamia uh, developing their civilizations. That's not nearly as long as 31,000 years, but it's a substantial period of time. Now look at the Western Hemisphere. It would take 13,000 years to get to Corral, to get to that first stone-built uh, urban type site. Mm -hmm. And then only 2,500 years, half the length of time, to get to major full-fledged urban, uh, you know, urban civilizations. Uh, the, per the precocity of the Western Hemisphere continues. Um, you can say, well, OK, it would take 5,500 years to get to the point where we have the origins of writing in Mesopotamia. But you only took 2,500 years to get from Corral to the origins of writing among the Olmecs. Um, the question is, why was there such uh, quite of the precocious development uh, continue uh, when the issue of isthmuses uh, is no longer questioned because you've now established a uh, civilizational pattern of some kind. And I suggest here that we go back and look at the issue of domestic animals. Uh, domestic animals um, don't exist in the new world. Uh, in a significant way. And they are everywhere in the old world. And we assume that domestic animals are a good thing because that's what we eat for dinner. And that surely is a good thing. But there's a lot of questions raised about the domestic animals. Um, the new world is often felt to be sort of poverty restriction because it didn't have in the areas where civilization, civilization was developing, it didn't have any animals uh, suitable for domestication. But maybe that was one of the great things. Maybe domestic animals uh, were a retardant of civilization. Um, when you look at that gap of 5,500 years, you say, you know, the first um, animal domestication is going to be somewhere around 8,000 years ago. And then the first truly agricultural, extensive urban civilization is going to be around 5,500 years ago. In other words, you have a, let's say, a 3,000 year gap. Well, looked at from the point of view of domestic animals, that gap is very interesting. Because we all think of cattle, in particular, as pulling plows. But cattle didn't pull plows when they were first domesticated. It was something like three or 4,000 years before cattle started to pull plows. Um, people did not drink milk when sheep and goats and cattle were first domesticated. They didn't use wool when sheep were first domesticated because the sheep didn't produce any wool. Um, what they all produced was meat. The development of wool and uh, fiber in general and milk products and labor uh, utility are all part of what um, students of domestication call secondary, uh, uh, secondary domestic uh, uh, utilities. In other words, these are things that were not anticipated, not anticipatable when the animals first came under control, but they developed over the course of time. The use of cattle for plowing, which then gives rise to the invention of wheeled vehicles, uh, dates from around uh, 4000 uh, BC. Uh, not from the period when cattle were first domesticated, about 8,000 BC. Uh, there is a big question. People were living on 
their miserable uh, harvest of wheat and barley for 4,000 years before they had any oxen to plow up the fields. And they were doing all right. <clears throat> Why did they want to have an ox? And who owned the ox? Um, what I believe probably was the case, that the people who owned the animals created civilization by forcing the farmers to use oxen and grow more grain, which then the ox owners would, uh, would take control of. But the, one of the problems is that these animals also created diseases. Uh, many of our most important diseases come uh, into human circulation through domestic animals. We all know this historically because when the Europeans arrived in the New World, they had these diseases originating from domestic animals uh, that killed off 80-90% of the New World population. But somehow we never asked whether those diseases originally killed off 80 or 90% of the people who were living with the animals when they were first domesticated. We say, oh, the, the Europeans developed immunities. We well, don't develop immunities until most people have died. Um, so one of the things that I think is likely is that uh, there were disease vectors that retarded the growth of civilization that were directly associated with developing a uh, way of cohabiting with domestic animals. And secondly, once you have developed domestic animal uh, uh, patterns, one of the most common developments is that you will develop pastoral herding. And nothing screws up a civilization quite so much as having a bunch of uh, animal-raising nomads coming in and killing everybody. Never happens in the New World. You know, the Aztecs of this whole text might go at it over and over again to kill one another, but they're not going to be raided by someone with 500,000 sheep that they're trying to, to feed. It's, it's just, a, you know, the the animal uh, husbandry side of things, uh, I suspect, was a major retardant through disease and through competition uh, between uh, settled people and herders. Uh, you know, the farmer and the cowboy can be friends. Uh, 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 so, uh, so I'm inclined to think that the new world, by not having the animals, uh, was in a much better situation in the old world. But it did, and I'll close on this, it did raise uh, one additional factor that uh, the Europeans later found uh, interesting and ascribed probably too much importance to. That is that if you don't have domestic animals mm -hmm. and something occurs where you need to have a blood sacrifice, um, Who's it going to be? <laughs> you, know, you can't call Ghostbusters. It's, uh, you know, you have to kill something to placate whatever spirits are out there or to, you know, to get ahead in the, uh, in the spiritual world. And if you, if you can't kill an animal, well, then you, you just got to kill one of you. So that the Europeans... Uh, found that human sacrifice was a hallmark of New World savagery. Um, and it never occurred to them that their own sacrifice of domestic animals was, in a sense, say, particularly from the point of view of modern animal rights activists, every bit as much as savagery. Um, and this has given rise to the perennial question in studies of animal domestication as to whether animal sacrifice in the old world was preceded by human sacrifice. Almost every culture we know of had human sacrifice very, very early on. And the question is whether the sacrifice of sheep and goats and uh, cattle and so forth uh, was a substitute for an earlier uh, era of, of human sacrifice. But in any case, the, this is, I was going to say, this is speculative the entire Lecture is entirely speculative. But my point is that uh, I think that when we 
uh, when we look at the eastern and the western hemispheres from the point of view of the earliest civilizations, from the point of view of domestic plants and animals, from the point of view of the nature of the, uh, of the urban civilizations and their uh, first beginnings as they occur, instead of looking exclusively at the old world because it's earlier, that we really have to look at them uh, together and say this is the experience of humankind coming out of the Paleolithic era. Uh, and the chronology is not really terribly important. Uh, what's important is what people do, because you know, nobody in Yucatan knew there were pyramids in Egypt. Nobody in Egypt knew that there was a pyramid in the Yucatan. Well, some people, of course, knew because they were viewing the wrong state. But I think that, that what we have done is create a world history um, and uh, enshrine it in popular textbooks, including my own, that, um, that really shortchanges uh, the Western Hemisphere and particularly shortchanges Southeast Asia uh, and, um, uh, and Southern China, because they were virtually uh, unmentioned in, in, in this whole kind of history. And I think that um, world history is in a stage where there's a great risk of um, a sort of a premature um, ossification, a, a premature uh, uh, agreement that there are certain things that are important in world history and then forget the rest. And I think this is way, way too early. I think that we should be reopening the whole concept of the, of the world in synchronous uh, or in any synchronous development um, in order to uh, to rediscover some of these parallels and similarities and uh, paradoxes that are really clearly there in the record and, um, and now need to be engrossed into a uh, better and more inclusive narrative of the history of the world. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. totally clear, I'll be happy to answer some questions. <laughs> oh, there's one particular. Uh, no, there was so much. Uh, but I, I, I lost two points. Um, one is, uh, in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, you, you didn't say why, or if I missed it, why uh, the towns, I mean, the, the big uh, architecture was developed uh, by the Mayans or in the Aztecs. Well, what was it? Was there climate change there as well? You see, I think once I think once you get your first urban structures, that there is a, they couldn't have come about, whether it's Quebec, Le Tepe, or uh, Chataliuk, or Corral. There's a model there of, of um, some sort of centralized exploitation of collective labor that, uh, that becomes almost an obsessive model. And uh, then you're going to get uh, divisions of labor that will then provide a, a template for future developments, whether it's in Peru or whether it's in Mexico. Now, by comparison, for example, in uh, old European civilization of uh, Ukraine and Romania, if you go back to, say, um, 3500 BC, uh, <coughs> There were, uh, there were settlements, you know, focused settlements in the Ukraine that were larger than any Sumerian city in terms of population, but that showed no internal differentiation in terms of, of wealth or possessions, so that you didn't have highly differentiated grave goods indicating chiefs and, and followers you had uh, the same functions were displayed in, in pretty much all of the uh, all the residences. You had a, a great concentration of people, but you did not have that move into a um, into the ninety nine percent and the one percent in which you're going to be able to command the labor that would turn that into a city. Once you could do that, 
I think it became um, a uh, say almost obsessive for some people to do it. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, confused myself because you mentioned you know that in, in Turkey uh, place uh, uh, what he, yeah. okay was, you know, had nothing to do with climate change that they, that they were made that they built that right. and yet in the fertile crescent things suddenly became much more right. intense because of the climate change. Right, so, 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 so that in Gubek, Lit, in Gubek Litepe, it's like uh, early Neolithic China before 4000 or old Europe, you have um, uh, structures. Um, you don't have much evidence of, so far of a social differentiation. Um, in the same way, for example, that at Stonehenge, we don't have much evidence of a social differentiation. Uh, there is a site in northern Sudan, um, west of the Nile River, out in the Sahara Desert, called uh, Nubta Playa, where you similarly have some large uh, stone structures that, um, that don't appear to be accompanied by uh, movements toward a ongoing uh, command of labor. So I'm, I, I, we don't know how Gobekli came to be built. So then, just to complete the thought, the Aztecs and the Mayans. So is there, but clearly there were priests, and there was a whole differentiation yeah. there, and yet did that come about because of climate change? No, I, I, I think so. That, that, that they had to be more condensed. I mean, may, I, may I just, I think you're missing, what his question is, is you said these are Isthmus civilizations, yeah. right? But his point was that the Isthmus is formed in Mesoamerica, by the the boundaries of the mountains and the other things, so their human beings are squeezed into those isthmus. But that is those same isthmuses were created with climate change in the Middle East. So you didn't need the climate change. Is that correct? You didn't need the climate change in Mesoamerica to create the compression. Well, the, 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 the the climate change that you had in uh, in the old world, if it was global, this uh, drying period um, would have occurred in the new world, but it would not have. Had about anything to do right. with it. Right. The climate change wasn't important to the creation of the <coughs> Mesoamerican civilization. Well, I can understand it on the, on, on the Incan, but I just don't quite see it for the Mayan and the, and the Aztec. You know, sort of where are the mountains? I mean, what was in the Mayan, especially? Well, the Mayans, uh, it's the Olmecs who are the first. Right. And there you do get the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, then the Mayans develop out of that in the same way that Chavin and Moche and Incas develop out of uh, what first occurs in the Peruvian desert. The derivative. Uh, you know, urban civilizations aren't necessarily in the same place as the uh, as the first instances. That's why I think it's a model that that, that um, has has an impact. Though that area around Corral never again becomes a uh, an important um, uh, you know urban urbanized area. It goes up into the mountains uh, uh, for the next round uh, with the uh, Mayans, it goes into the uh, into the Yucatan, the Belize, and places like that. It's really one of the things that occurred to me when I was first studying this is that um, many people have argued that, and still do argue that, on the basis of old world history, that um, temperate zones are a sine qua non of civilization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and that you can never have a civilization originating in the tropics, in a rainforest. How could that ever happen? How could you get a civilization originating in the Congo? And yet, in the New World, you do get civilizations in the middle of the rainforest. All of the civilizations of the New World are in the tropics. None of the civilizations of the Old World are in the tropics. And, uh, and yet we maintain a, a notion that the tropics are, well, the, we use the word tropic and <coughs> tropical in a way almost identical to, uh, to the word oriental as Edward Said construed it. <laughs> we say, oh, that's a tropical mm -hmm. environment. That means that it's lethargic, it has sexual excess, it has nudity, it has um, uh, easy living. Great music. Yeah. <laughs> great sense of rhythm uh, and so forth um, and, and we certainly 
do not think of people in the tropics as having potency um, because they're they're tropical, they're lethargic. Um, the the thing is that um, Edward came from the culture that he was identifying as the object of derision on the part of the Europeans. Whereas there's been no one from the tropics so far who's come along and said, we should get rid of this word tropical. <laughs> uh, because it is so insulting, so demeaning, uh, and it's exactly like, like the word oriental. And, um, and we, must, uh, we must abandon it. But one way to, to make that point is to look at this comparison where you can have uh, the remnants of uh, Mayan um, horticulture in in rainforests, where you can see that they once arranged you know, fruit tree cultivation and so on and so on, and proper drainage and so on, and it's in the middle of uh, the rainforest, and we have to say, you know, uh, that potency is there, uh, whether it's tropical or whether it's temperate, and this then addresses the great question that. Uh, Arnold Toynbee raised, which was, why didn't the Rio Grande develop a civilization? Because it has a, um, a river um, regime very much like the Tigris and Euphrates, and no civilization. But it was the wrong question. Um, so, um, The idea that uh, human sacrifice came before animal sacrifice is probably illustrated by the story of Abraham and Isaac, or Abraham and Ishmael. Uh, my, yes. qu my question is about uh, male proclivity to head for the hills. Uh, how do you account for procreation in the rise of uh, uh, demography? Uh, Rob Roy from the Hillens came down to the Lowland border to steal away a bonny wife to keep, his, <laughs> to keep his house in order. Um, we. Once you once the males disperse, um, they will find a way to steal themselves a woman or another guy. But it's um, uh, I'm not worried too much about that. I think we think we've we've been too focused on uh, rhesus monkeys and gibbons and chimpanzees and so forth. And so I would assume that the women raised the children and therefore were the uh, main influence on uh, the the uh, upbringing of the children. Yeah, well, uh, <coughs> is that your experience? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, in any way, in any case, the business of human sacrifice, um, it's true that the Abraham Isaac story, uh, which we know was accompanied by human sacrifice among other Canaanite groups, uh, and sort of symbolizes that the uh, children of Israel will not continue to engage in this, uh, that's sort of a benchmark, but it's rather late. Um, in terms of city domestication. The more, more important things are things like um, the uh, Indo-European cosmological deaths, the uh, Purusha Sutta that you have in the <coughs> Avesta, where you have a human who is killed, and then the whole universe is made out of his body parts. Uh, so the skull becomes the heavens, and so on and so on, and the different parts become the different orders of society. Uh, that's paralleled um, Norse mythology by, uh, by the uh, killing of the giant Enir, who then becomes a, a source of, uh, of parts. Um, you know, you, you don't have as much appearance of domestic animals in cosmological creator myths as you have of, of sacrificed humans. And, um, I say almost every society has evidence of some degree of human sacrifice. It happens that we have a textual um, <coughs> preservation in, uh, in the Bible, but it's by far the, you know, it's not the only, you know, case. Karen? I have an odd advantage. I, I think I might be the only person here who's heard this lecture twice, with variations now, because I heard the one in Chippenberg uh, on your second opinion on the right articles of that What comes to mind this time? Is this question of crustaceans and, and, and your fish theory, which I think you're quite on with that, I'm wondering whether the ban that we have, that we start to see in religious texts like the Hebrew Bible, etc., on the eating of crustaceans, 
is that you think hmm. any linkage? Like maybe there was an attempt to stop this. You know, I hate to say this given the nature of our culture, but I think the Hebrew Bible is a very late text mm -hmm. with respect to all the things I'm talking about. Um, and so I'm, I'm disinclined to, to read over much uh, into it. And then also our reading of the Hebrew Bible in these areas has been uh, powerfully affected by assumptions that we've had about uh, Jewish religion and so forth and so on. Um, but do you know any other examples that predated uh, that could be related to an attempt to try to protect uh, dwindling stocks? Maybe I'm just trying to set Oh, I, I, I think that's a, uh, you know, a scientific um, rationale that is as unlikely as the idea that a prohibition on pork is going to prevent mm. trichinosis. I think this, this was a 19th century form of biblical mm -hmm. uh, commentary that was trying to align it with the Enlightenment that makes no sense at all. The, uh, the, the great fundamental truth of the laws of Kashrut, as I read the Bible, is that um, uh, the Jews couldn't eat donkeys. They couldn't. Donkeys. They couldn't eat pigs. They didn't have any pigs. Mm -hmm. But you look at, <coughs> at the stories of battles and the uh, chronicles and kings and so forth. They're continually capturing the livestock of their enemies, and they'll have you know so many cattle and so many sheep and so many donkeys. They, they can't eat the donkeys. What do they have the damn donkeys for? Why do you need five thousand donkeys? But there is a um, <coughs> Uh, a verse in the, in the Torah that is parallel to the story of Abraham and, um, and Isaac, which says that um, you must uh, sacrifice the firstborn of all of your domestic animals, except the donkey. You're prohibited from sacrificing the firstborn of your donkey, but you must sacrifice a substitute <coughs> animal. Um, and if you do not have a substitute animal, if you don't have a ram with his horn caught in the bushes, uh, then you have to strangle the donkey. Okay. Now, you're killing the donkey, you're killing the, the young donkey either way. But the important thing is that the donkey must be strangled. Because if it's strangled, um, uh, you can't eat the meat because there's blood in it. So that, that the main thing is that um, uh, you know, you use the Abraham story to show that we will never again sacrifice children. And you use the, uh, the donkey story to say, we will never again eat donkeys. Um, because donkeys were sacred. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the sacrality of donkeys has been almost completely ignored, except in my recent novel, <laughs> <laughs> available on Amazon or for your Kindle, called The One Donkey Solution, which recovers the lost history of the sacred Semitic donkey. Well, I think on that note... <laughs> <laughs> oh, please don't end on the donkey now, please. <laughs> that when Dr. S.T. Lee endowed this lectureship, he never thought of following the fish and decline into civilization um, to be critical issues in international history. But I think that um, Professor Bullitt has shown, in fact, that they are, and I expect that many other scholars will follow up on this. So with that, I want to thank all of you for coming, and especially thank Professor Bullitt for this really expansive and stimulating vision. Thank you very much.
So I can see you want me to go on more.